So just um, as real quick review, I know we just kind of went over it, but this is a nephron. Um, again, we have blood vessels coming in to the glomerulus, the Bowman's capsule. Okay, the nephric filtrate travels down. Uh, this part is called the proximal convoluted tubule. You don't really have to know that, but it loops down, the loop of Henle, then it comes back up through the distal convoluted tubule, and eventually um, connects with the collecting duct. And each of these would be connected to a, a different nephron so that urine can travel to okay. um, This shows a little bit of where various um, parts of um, the urine and the nephric filtrate come into and out of that. And so it's quite complex. And as on these convoluted tubules, as they um, travel up and down, the properties of those cells change and they each use different um, proteins in the membranes to extract different things from the nephric filtrate. So it's quite a complicated process, but um, the result is that waste products end up in the urine, um, and the kidney can, can regulate the amounts of various um, compounds and minerals in our body by regulating how much it puts into the urine. And so that's how our body regulates our um, water balance and so forth. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of the possible diseases, disorders, malfunctions of the excretory system in humans. Um, so kidney disease, in general, um, is a sort of wide-ranging group of diseases. There's lots of things that could cause kidney failure. Okay, um, Physical, well, Let's start with this. Um, so if the kidneys are malfunctioning, if the kidneys are not working properly, then obviously the levels of these waste products and minerals and water and so forth in the body is not properly regulated. And that homeostasis is not maintained. Okay? There could be excess urea left in the blood, excess salts, water can accumulate. Um, and so there's a term for this when the waste products that are normally eliminated in the urine um, are not and remain in the blood is called uremia, okay? It means urine in the blood. And it can lead to a whole host of negative health consequences, okay? As these waste pop products build up in the blood, basically they poison us, okay? And it leads to things like um, lethargy in the beginning, like being tired, okay? Uh, lack of an appetite, okay? Not being on confusion, mental sluggishness, um, seizures eventually, twitching, comas, and eventually death. If the kidneys fail completely, um, that leads to death because those, those toxins build up and um, we can't survive that. Um, so why do the kidneys not function properly? There's many different reasons, okay? Sometimes low blood pressure can result in the kidneys not working properly because that nephric filtrate is not forced out through the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule. If you have lower blood pressure, then enough of that um, plasma and other substances is not filtered out, and so the kidneys are not filtering properly. At the same time, high blood pressure um, can damage the kidneys. Okay? That leads to inefficient filtration. It can damage the tubules of that nephron because of that high pressure, and that's not, that's not good as well. There are also um, other ways kidneys can be damaged. Drugs, toxins, heavy metals. Um, these can damage and, and clog and, and uh, destroy the nephrons so that they no longer work. Physical damage, you know, trauma to the lower back or um, a problem during surgery, things like that can cause the kidneys to physically become damaged and not work well. Too much protein consistently in the diet can lead to the kidney sort of being overworked and having to filter out so much nitrogen because of the breakdown of those proteins that it can um, damage the nephrons. So there's a whole series of reasons um, why the kidneys may not work. Another example of a, an issue with the kidneys are kidney stones. Okay? Kidney stones are when minerals, obviously the kidneys and the nephrons are um, removing minerals from 
from the blood. And sometimes those minerals crystallize. Okay? Rather than staying dissolved in the nephric filtrate and in the urine, they start to crystallize. And they form little secretions that build up and get larger and larger. Um, and this is a kidney stone. This is a very large kidney stone. This is almost a centimeter, not quite a centimeter uh, in width. So that's something about this big. And so that kidney stone, um, depending on where it forms, has to pass through the ureter, which is not a very large tube, into the urinary bladder. And then, uh, to be expelled from the body, has to pass through the urethra. So you have a one centimeter stone traveling through those tubes, it's quite painful. And if you ever known anybody that has had kidney stones, um, they will probably tell you that it is you know, one of the most painful experiences that they've had, depending on the size of the kidney stone. Um, and so some people just tend to form these. It could be um, due to um, not enough water, the person not taking in enough water, and so those, some of those minerals don't stay dissolved. Um, but that's, that's one problem. Sometimes they try to break them up. They can, a person's having a kidney stone, sometimes they use um, ultrasound sound waves where they try to pulse the um, kidney stones with sound waves to try to break them up somewhat. They can sometimes do surgery, um, but oftentimes they just have to wait until the kidney stone passes completely through the urinary system and out of the body. Um, another disorder or disease of the um, excretory system is something called gout, you may have heard of. Um, and gout is when uric acid um, so we excrete most of our nitrogen, we know, as urea. But there's some uric acid produced. And when that uric acid, um, it can, it's, you know, it's not soluble in water. And so sometimes it's deposited in the joints of the body. And it leads to these crystals forming and leads to a lot of pain and using um, the joints and bending things. And people that have gout you know, might have difficulty walking and so forth because of this building up in their joints. It used to be called a rich man's disease or a king's disease because um, some of the, it's sometimes dietary um, dependent. So if somebody has gout, they will be told to avoid eating certain foods, certain meats, shellfish, alcohol, for example. And so it was called this because it would be a disease that would affect people that were, um, that had access to those. And so if we think about that historically, only rich people could eat meat and uh, shellfish and so forth. When the kidneys do fail, um, first off, one kidney can fulfill basically all of the excretory function for a person. So you can live just fine and completely normally with only a single working kidney. So if you had some sort of trauma, some damage, and it only affected one of your kidneys, you could, you could be fine with, with the other kidney functioning. Um, but if both kidneys are not functioning, that's a problem. So if neither kidney is functioning, then a person can't survive. Because we just talked about um, those waste products building up and eventually poisoning, it, poisoning us. So people can receive a kidney transplant. Kidneys can be transplanted from one person to another. Um, often they are between uh, living people. So you can, if you had a relative maybe that had kidney disease and um, they were in need of a donor kidney, to stay alive. Um, they could test family members and close relatives. And if they're a, a proper match, then you could take a healthy kidney from one person, transplant it into um, the other person, and you would live fine because you have one functioning kidney. And then your relative could be okay because they now have one functioning kidney. So kidneys can be transplanted. Sometimes kidneys are donated by people who donate their organs when they pass away. That's another option. Um, but there are far more people waiting for kidneys than there are um, people that have donated kidneys. So there's a, a, a list, basically, of people that are waiting because their kidneys have failed and are waiting for a kidney transplant until uh, a match comes up. Um, and when they do transplant that kidney, um, they basically uh, just reattach it to the blood vessels and so forth. Um, like you see here, they leave the uh, other kidneys in. And then um, a person that gets a, any organ transplant, really, is typically on, for the rest of their lives, immunosuppressant drugs. 
what do those drugs do? And why do you need them if you get a transplant? Grace? They suppress the immune system because it's an unfamiliar organ. Yeah. Getting another person's organ transplanted into your body, even if it's a close match, you know, they do blood typing and, and genetic typing to make sure it's close enough, but your body may still recognize that as foreign, just like it recognizes a foreign pathogen in your body, and attempt your immune system may attempt to destroy that organ. That when you, if you ever have heard about an organ being rejected, that's what that term means, that a person's own immune system um, attacked and damaged um, an organ that was transplanted. So you usually have to take these medications that lower your immune system's functioning. Now obviously that has its own side effects because then you're um, more likely to um, get an infection or, or some other disease because your immune system's not working at, at its height, but it allows you to not reject those organs. So if a person has kidney failure but they are not able to get a transplant right away, there are treatments that can help keep them um, alive while they're awaiting that transplant. And one of those is, is called dialysis. You've probably heard of dialysis. It's called hemodialysis, also dialysis of the blood. And so dialysis is basically when you get hooked up to a machine, as seen here, and um, it basically acts as an artificial kidney. And so typically a person in the United States that needs dialysis would go several times a week to a dialysis treatment clinic. And they would stay there for several hours. And they basically get hooked up to, um, to an IV into uh, an artery and a vein. And basically their blood leaves their veins, goes into a machine. Uh, in that machine, basically just works by the infusion and osmosis, okay? What you have is their blood leaves their body through one of these tubes, okay? The pressure is monitored, and it goes through a little piece of apparatus called a dialysizer, and they have fluid that they pump into that, okay? And so obviously, from your blood, there's some dialysis tubing. You know, we use that when we model a cell when we were talking about osmosis and diffusion. So they use this semi-permeable, mm -hmm. Um, plastic tubing, and what happens is molecules from this person's blood diffuse out um, into this dialysate liquid that they're adding, and that removes some of those toxins from their blood, okay? And then that blood gets pumped back into their body, into a vein, um, and then that blood has had some of those toxins removed. Um, now the contents of this dialysis fluid will determine what substances are removed from the blood, how much is removed from the blood. So basically a doctor, um, a nephrologist, a doctor that focuses on kidneys will prescribe sort of a certain type of um, this dialysis fluid to determine what things are going to be removed from the blood and which things are not. And so a um, person goes for that treatment several times a week and that can keep them, uh, it doesn't function as well as an actual kidney but it can do enough so that they don't, um, that that doesn't become um, a deadly situation. Um, and so eventually really they're waiting for a kidney transplant so they can be independent. There are now dialysis treatments that a person can um, do at home um, daily. That's a, a sort of newer option, um, but um, that's, that's what dialysis is, basically an artificial kidney. Okay, last couple things here. Um, uh, urinary tract infection, you may have heard of UTI, um, is a, a, a bacterial infection in the um, urinary tract because bacteria can get into the urinary system through the urethra, okay, can get into the bladder, can get into the ureter, and even sometimes into the kidneys. Um, urinary tract infections are much more common in women than they are in men. And that has to do with the anatomy of the urethra, that in um, women, the urethra is much shorter than it is in um, males. And so it's more likely for bacteria to be able to reach the bladder in women than it is in males. And it's treated with antibiotics and, and so forth. <clears throat> um, liver failure is, again, liver is an excretory organ. Um, and liver failure um, can, lead, can be caused by lots of different things. 
damage to the liver because of um, alcohol abuse. So alcohol, the, the liver is responsible for detoxifying alcohol from the blood. And so if it's repeatedly um, exposed to alcohol um, over a period of time, it can become damaged. And that's sometimes called cirrhosis of the liver, damage to the liver that leads to it not fulfilling its, its function. Um, infections, uh, hepatitis is um, uh, uh, an infection that damages the liver. There's various types of hepatitis. Um, cancer, cancer can affect the liver. Um, toxins, a person ingests some sort of poisons, the liver detoxifies them, but sometimes it damages the liver. And you know, symptoms of liver damage, you know, this looks, is, um, one thing is that because our liver helps to recycle red blood cells and remove the hemoglobin that produces um, substance called bilirubin. And if that builds up in the body, um, that leads to jaundice, which is when a person's skin and the whites of their eyes take on a yellowish color. Uh, often it um, happens in, in newborn babies and they, they may develop jaundice, um, lead to fluid, fluid building up in the ab abdomen, swelling, bleeding, whole host. And again, liver failure, um, complete liver failure is a, a fatal. So you can have a liver transplant. And again, same sort of thing. People are waiting for liver transplants. Um, although there's not really a treatment like dialysis that can take over function of the liver. Oh, the last one. Um, so there's another uh, excretory malfunction called diabetes insipidus. Now this is very confusing um, because what you would typically think of as diabetes is a, a difficulty regulating blood sugar due to a lack of insulin. This is completely separate and has separate different causes and um, different effects. About the only similarity between diabetes insipidus and di diabetes mellitus, which is the typical type of diabetes you might have heard of, um, is that it leads to frequent urination. But um, one thing back with, right, with the typical diabetes is that one of the ways they diagnose somebody with diabetes is testing their urine for glucose. Because typically, urine doesn't have glucose in it. Okay, that the glucose gets forced into the nephric filtrate but then it gets reabsorbed back into the blood. Okay. But if a person has diabetes and has extremely high blood sugar, not all of that glucose gets reabsorbed into the blood and some of that ends up in the urine and that's why a simple urine test can test if a person has diabetes. Um, in fact, before we had modern tests, you know, 200 years ago, they diagnosed diabetes by tasting some of the urine. And if the urine is sweet, then that's a, that's a sign that um, they have diabetes. Well, how would they know like, what to base that off of? Because typically urine has zero glucose. So if you try some regular urine from a normal individual without diabetes, it would not taste sweet. Then if you have a little sip of urine from a person with diabetes, Wait, so you're going to notice a job. Person. Uh, probably the doctor did it, yeah. I mean, yeah. typically though, your, urine, is, urine is pretty much sterile. doesn't have bacteria and so forth. Um, so. Can you use it as hydration? Or yeah, no, why not? Bear drills does it all the time. Why not? <laughs> Think about this logically. Why can you not use urine for hydration? Oh, because it's kind of like just like, like it goes in and then like literally it's like you're excused out, so it's like not really increasing the amount of water you're taking. Yeah, I mean, it's the same amount of water, but there is some water there. But what is the purpose of urine? Really right. So if you drink it, have you actually gotten rid of those toxins? No. No, because you're putting them right back into your body again. And after, and so those those levels, you're never actually getting rid of them. Yeah, those we'll levels of those, it's basically like your kidneys are not functioning anymore. Oh. If you're drinking your own urine, because all the things your kidneys are getting rid of, you're just putting right back into your body. And so the levels of urea and all those other compounds just gonna increase in your blood and you're basically gonna poison yourself. Yeah. So it's not so much about the water. If you distilled urine and drank just the water portion and left all the other waste products, then you'd be okay. Yeah, you boil, if you, if you take a pot full of urine on your stove, okay, boil it away, catch, catch the evaporating water, 
Okay? That's just that's just water, then you could drink that. Alright, let's uh let me finish this. So anyway, diabetes insipidus. Um, our pituitary gland in our brain produces a hormone called vasopressin. And vasopressin is also called antidiuretic hormone. Basically, it causes our arteries to constrict. Okay? And it increases the reabsorption of water in our nephrons. But sometimes this process doesn't work well. Typically, if a person gets dehydrated, their pituitary gland detects it, sends some more vasopressin into the blood, and then our kidneys start conserving more water. And so we don't dehydrate as quickly. But if the pituitary gland is unable to do that, it leads to this process breaking down and the kidneys produce very, very watery urine all the time, regardless of your hydration levels. And so that leads to you becoming dehydrated much more quickly. Um, and so it, it basically, if it's untreated, can let, lead to a person dehydrating, um, even though um, they're producing clear urine because this feedback system of the pituitary gland is not working properly. Well. But it's unrelated to typical diabetes related to blood sugar. Okay, any questions? Wait, so basically the right like the other diabetes without the blood uh, It's really to be honest, it's nothing like regular diabetes that you're familiar with. It's just called that. It's only it's a completely different cause, completely different effects. The only similarity is that they both lead to frequent urination. Yes, take a break.